Please stand with us. Let's lift our voices and praise.
amazing, powerful, almighty God. Lord God, you are all knowing. You uh, are the creator of all, Lord God. And we are humbled this morning to be in your presence. Father God, uh, we come before you this morning uh, uh, repentant, Lord God, because we daily say things and do things and think things that are unpleasing to you. And uh, Father, we, uh, we don't do things that we know that you are telling us that we should do, Lord God. So, Father, we, uh, we're claiming the blood of Jesus Christ this morning that we might uh, come before you and pray this morning purified and uh, washed white as, uh, white as snow. Father God, we have so much to be thankful for. We have clothing when many live in rags. We have houses when many live in shacks or sleep on the street. We have food to eat when many go hungry. Lord God, uh, you have blessed us abundantly. And, and Father, we don't want to forget how much we're blessed and forget those who have so much less. Lord God, we come to you this morning and, and uh, we think of those among us and in our area who are suffering. Father, those who uh, have pains and sickness, uh, those who uh, wonder what uh, life holds in store for them, and uh, Lord, there are those that are suffering emotional pains, and Lord, we pray for those, uplift those people, Lord God. Father, we think of, uh, I think of Jared this week as he goes for uh, tests, and uh, Lord God, we continue to pray for him in a whole the Mitchell family. Uh, Father God, uh, we think of uh, Fred Banks, who, uh, who just had surgery and two stents put in, Howard Millian's son-in-law. We ask a, a blessing there. And there's so much uh, destruction in this world, Lord God, we think of Oklahoma and uh, all the heartache and pain and suffering that is going on there even at this time, Lord God, and uh, in other places as well in, in the world. Father God, you are a healing, a healing God, and uh, you heal our bodies and our souls, and uh, we thank you for that. We lift up these things in Jesus' name, we pray.
big important event. You guys aren't used to this. So. What's going on in the world today? I mean, you've got Oklahoma City, there's a lot of really cheap effort going on there, that's important. What's some stuff going on? Like, Serious. Stand the Cup Farms. Stand the Cup Farms. What was that? Syria. Syria. Anybody else? Homeless. Homeless people. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot going on in the world today, right? Here's the birthday. That's important and that's important. What's the most important thing going on today in the world? What do you consider to be the most important thing going on in the world today?
job to watch it on, uh, on video, and I really appreciate his heart. And uh, he really did speak from the heart uh, last week. And uh, he talked about his, his dad and the lessons that he learned from his dad. And uh, I think he talked about a year in 1987, right? Which is phenomenal because I was a freshman in college in 1987, and I can assure you, I don't remember a whole lot of anything that somebody told me. I've <laughs> um, been trying to remember. But uh, Mark did a great job talking about things that he learned from his dad. And one of the things that he talked about that I keyed in on was this. Uh, if you believe in something, then you should live it. If you believe in something, you should live it. And I think that sums up the life of a Jesus follower, doesn't it? If you believe in something, you should live it. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about the most important truth in the world. The most important fact is that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. That he resurrected from the dead. And Paul went on to say in 1 Corinthians 15, if that event did not occur, then we are a pitiful people. Because everything we believe in is, is wrong. It's based on a flawed premise. But if the event, the historical, actual event of the resurrection of Jesus did take place, then Paul said, live it. Live the mission of Jesus. And uh, so if you believe it, you should live it. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we started a uh, series, Marriage and the Jesus Follower. And we asked three questions that are designed to help us to uh, reflect on our own mission for Jesus, on our own relationship with Jesus, how it's going for us personally, how it's going with us as, as married couples. And those three questions basically were, first, do I love Jesus more than my stuff? That's a, that's a teaching that Jesus uh, shared with us. Do I love Jesus more than my stuff? The second one is, is my family more important to me than the family of God? Or is the family of God more important to me than my own? Is the family of God more important to me than my own? That's a teaching of Jesus. And then the third question we reflect and we ask is, am I gladly, uh, do I, uh, am I gladly uh, ready to go share the gospel of Jesus, to leave my home to share the gospel of Jesus to those who need to hear it? Uh, do I, am I gladly prepared for that, to leave my home? Am I willing to do that? That's the third question, because that's a, that's a teaching of Jesus. All three of those are based, all three of those questions are based on the teaching of Jesus. And we talked about how Jesus followers can answer those questions with a resounding yes. I do love Jesus more than my stuff. Yes, I do consider the family of God more important than my own. And yes, I would gladly leave my home willingly to share the gospel of Jesus to those who've never heard. Those are three questions that can be answered yes uh, by a Jesus follower. And uh, so we talked about that last week. We talked about how, or a couple weeks ago, we talked about how selfishness gets in the way of those things. Selfishness gets in the way of a Jesus follower. And all of us deal with selfishness. Because we're all selfish. And this is why Jesus said in Luke 2, uh, 1923, If you want to be a follower of me, you must deny yourself. Every single day. Jesus didn't say it's a one-time event. It can't be for us. Because we struggle with selfishness. We struggle with it every day. It's in our human nature. And so we struggle with selfishness. And so Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, you have to lay down your selfishness. You have to give up your selfish nature. You have to become a different person. And that leads us to what we're talking about today. It is necessary to change who you are. It is necessary to change who you are. You cannot be a follower of Jesus and remain the same you've always been. Before you were a follower, after a follower, there are, or after you, before Jesus, after Jesus, there are marked differences in the lives of a person. Uh, in your outline, or if you're following along on the blog, I have listed a bunch of scriptures that speak to this. And there's more, but I just listed some. So if you're interested in reading some of those, you can. But our culture is addicted to affirmation. 
You can't read Facebook and Twitter without coming away with the idea that our young people especially just want to be affirmed. Just accept me for who I am. That's what they're crying out for. Just accept me for who I am. Why can't you just accept me for who I am? And that's something that's built into our, I think, with every passing generation. We're becoming more and more addicted as a people or as a culture to affirmation. Just accept me. The problem is the New Testament doesn't teach that. The New Testament says that God doesn't accept you for who you are. God does not accept you for who you are unless you're in Jesus Christ. Because it's Jesus God accepts. And again, I put those scriptures in your outline and on the blog if you want to take a look at those. It's Jesus God accepts. A person in Jesus is someone God accepts. A person outside of Jesus, God doesn't accept that person. Does he love everyone? Yes, God loves everyone. But only those who are in Jesus are accepted. That's the message of Scripture. I know it's harsh. I know it's hard, but it's true. It's in the Bible. It's the truth of the New Testament. It's necessary to change who you are. Over and over and over and over again, the New Testament says you must become a new person. Romans 12, 2. Transform. Allow God to transform your mind, to change the way you think as you become a new person. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And there's a ton of other scriptures that say the same thing. So it's important to change who you are. Now, if you're reading along on the blog, if you're following along, or if you're on your outline, this morning I'm doing things a little different. Because those things are designed as a complement to what we're talking about. The scriptures are in there if you want to read them, and you can follow along that way if you want to. But this morning I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to do more of an illustration with you this morning. Uh, because for me, it's just easier to talk about it that way. I'm more of a visual learner. And so every once in a while, I like to change things up and do things a little different, if that's okay with you guys. Uh, so I have a lovely assistant. <laughs> you have to. My, my Vanna White, although she's much better looking. Uh, here's the thing we want to talk about. And I'm, I know you guys don't like it. I'm going to make it real difficult on Jeannie this morning, but... Uh, I want to come down here and talk to you guys this morning. Uh, I think it's easier for us to address the concept of relationship when we're talking about two human people. Because humanity is something we relate to because, duh, we're human beings. Uh, it's a little bit more abstract to think of relationship with God or with Jesus because that's not something we we see or we experience like we would another human being. So let's start first with explaining what we're talking about this morning. It's necessary to change you are with a marriage relationship or the marriage concept. Jesus uses marriage. He uses the bride and the groom analogy several times when he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Paul goes on to talk about marriage in Ephesians especially. He talks about how uh, marriage and, and between a, a relationship between a man and a woman the intimacy that exists between uh, in a marriage uh, relationship is the intimacy that God is looking for in a relationship with him. But what, what that looks like and what that means, we have, a, we have a better tendency to understand when we're talking about two human people in a marriage relationship. So let's just start there. So let's put up the first question. Let's put up, a, well, the only question we're going to deal with is why. Because when you're talking about changing who you are, you're talking about motive. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus looks at a bunch of religious people, just like you and I, except these people were like freaks for religion. I mean, these people were all about religious ritual. Uh, they, uh, they did everything the right way. The right stuff, the right way. That's what these people did. They were called Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, uh, religious leaders of the day. They were the Saturday school, school teachers. They were the big wigs of the religious uh, folks of that day and Jesus looked at them he looked at them the religious people the people who had it all right the people who were doing everything right and he looked at them and he said this their 
They worship me with their lips, with their bodies. They do all the right stuff. If you read through Matthew 15, you'll, you'll see in context, Jesus takes one example of their religious ritual where he talks about they wash their hands. They do it the right way. They worship me with their lips. They're clean on the outside, but their hearts are far from me. Over and over and over and over again in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God continues to hammer home that he's looking for the heart of a person, not the actions. He's looking for the obedience of the person, not the worship, not the sacrifice, the obedience, the heart of why we do what we do. So that's the question. Why? Now I'm just going to run a scenario by you. This may just be me. It may just be something I do. But I don't think so. I think this might hit a chord with a lot of other folks, but I don't know. Uh, it may just be me. But let's say I, I don't follow hockey much, although Patrick Law, new coach of the Avalanche, woo! Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I don't follow hockey much, but I know a lot of folks in here do. Because for most uh, Canadians, hockey is where it's at, it's what it's all about. And that's, that's cool. Okay, so let's use, let's say there's a big hockey game on. Uh, it's game seven of the Stanley Cup Finals. Does it get more, any more important than that? Nope. Okay. So it's game seven of the Stanley Cup Finals, and I wanna watch it. I know not everyone in here is gonna care about that. I see Ian over there going, I don't care about that. Uh, but for most people, for Ian it's something else. For other folks, not everyone's into hockey, I get that. But let's just say for, for most of us, that's, that would be something that would be pretty important for us to watch. So let's just go with that. It's Game 7, Stanley Cup Finals. I know that game is on and I come home, but I know that there's a couple of things, some honeydew things. Did you find that one? There's a couple of honeydew things that uh, Christy's been after me to do that I haven't gotten done. And I've got a lot of good excuses for why I haven't done them. They just don't seem very good excuses to her for some reason. But to me they are. But I have a couple of things that she's been wanting me to do. And I know this in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals is on that night. So what I do when I come home is I take care of a couple of those things, right? Why do I do that? Because I want to watch Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals. <laughs> in peace. <laughs> But then I noticed that in the, la in the uh, living room, there's, uh, there's some laundry that hasn't been folded. And so uh, maybe a couple things around the house that need to be done. And you know what I do? I do them. Not only do I do them, but I make sure she knows that I do them. Very slyly, of course. I'll say something to the effect of, now is anyone else guilty of this or is it just me? Anyway, I'll come home and I'll say something like, Honey, I just want you to know that there was some laundry unfolded in the living room, and I just want you to know I took care of that for you. It's not there anymore because uh, I did that. <laughs> why do I do that? Why did I do that? In that particular case, why did I do that? Because Game 7, the Stanley Cup Finals. I want to watch it in peace. Uh, what else? Well, uh, Christy likes it when I listen to her. There you go. <laughs> she likes it when I listen. Not only when I listen to her, but when I look at her when she's talking. Is that a big deal with any of the other ladies? Really? I gotta tell you, that's really a challenge when you're driving. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's hard to do when you're driving. But Christy thinks that when I'm looking at her, I'm listening. And I want her to think that. <laughs> Especially on this particular day because of Game 7 the Stanley Cup Finals and I want to watch the game in peace. And so I look at her and I listen to her as she talks and talks and talks and talks. But I'm okay with that. Then I go above and beyond. I go above and beyond. She's in the kitchen. She's slaving away like she always does making her tuna fish casserole or whatever. And I come up behind her, and I give her a big hug. And I even give her a kiss. And I look her in the eyes and I squint, because when you squint, you know you're serious. <laughs> and I squint and I say, honey, I just want you to know 
that I love you now more than the day we got married. I just want you to know that. <laughs> Now, I don't know about any of you, but this is the case for me because Christy's a smart kid. She knows something's up. I got a couple things on the honeydew list. I folded some laundry. I listened and I looked at her when she talked. And I even gave her a kiss and I gave her a big hug. Here's what she's going to ask. What do you want? What do you want? And at first, I'll feign. What? What, what? what are you talking about? I, I love you, honey. That's what I, yeah, I love you. She's like, yeah, right. What do you want, for real? Yeah. Well, game seven, Stanley Cup finals. I was kind of wondering if maybe I could sit and watch it tonight. And... Now, if I were going to ask you, Does that, do I love my wife? The answer to that question is a resounding yes, I love her. I think everybody would say, I love the person that I'm married to. At least I, I would hope you, you would say that. <laughs> if not, you might, I've got a great couch in my office now, <laughs> and we can have a talk, because that's a problem. But I think most of us would say, or all of us hopefully would say, I love my wife. Now, I do these things. There may be times because I'm a human being and selfishness is a part of my core. You understand what I'm saying? So, yes, yes, sometimes I do things because I want something in return. But that's not the overall reason for why I bless my wife and why I do things for her or with her. The, the big reason for why I do that, the, the real reason is because I love her. I love her with every ounce of my being. I just want to be around her. I want to be with her. I can't get enough of her because I love her. And I would do anything to bless her. I would do anything that would make her happy because I love her. Now, in a context of a marriage relationship, I think we understand that. I think we get it. It's easy to understand that. It's easy to see that because we're human beings. This is a human relationship. We can relate. It makes sense. But let's change gears for just a second, and let's cross over into spiritual relationship. Let's make this about Jesus now. Same question. Why do I do what I do? Now, there are maybe certain cases where we're coming to Jesus for different reasons, for something we need from him, something we want him to do for us. Maybe we get baptized because we want to be saved. Is that a wrong thing? Not necessarily. But there is a more mature understanding which we'll get to in a second. But I, I want something from Jesus, so I'm going to do something to get that from him. So I'm going to get baptized so I can get saved, because that's what Jesus can do for me, so that's what I'm going to do for him. Like when I go home, I'm going to do something because for Christy, because I want to watch the Stanley Cup finals. So I figure tit for tat. I do something, I get something. I get baptized, I get saved. You see that analogy? Can you see the comparison? How about another one? I pray. When Jared was diagnosed with cancer, was it wrong that Christy and I went to our knees begging God for healing? I think a lot of you did this. If not all of you did the same thing. Was that a wrong thing? No, it's not a wrong thing. We're told to pray for stuff we need. But there is a more mature understanding about prayer, about why we pray. There's a more mature understanding for why we are baptized, do other things. What about worship? We talked about the communion table this morning. Stephen said, this is the most important thing we do on Sunday. Do you guys believe that? Do you agree with that? Communion time? If communion time is the most important thing we do on a Sunday, why is it not the most important thing we do every day? 
Why would it just be the most important thing we do for 10 minutes during a week? Why do we take communion? Why do we come around a table, metaphorically speaking? Why do we do that? The answers are probably as varied as there are people in the room. If we we're going to ask, everyone might have their own reason. But there is a mature understanding about this, of why we do this, of why we do church, why we come together, why we worship, why we do things. Sometimes we, we say, well, I'm going to go to church because I need something from, from God. I, I need to become a better person so that I can, you know, I've heard people say I've lost my job. I've, uh, I, my life is in a toilet, so I guess I better start going back to church. As if going back to church is going to make all those other things okay. You understand? I mean, sometimes that's our attitude. We say, I'm going to do something so that God will do something for me. Just like I would go home and say, I'm going to do the dishes so that later I'll be able to watch the Stanley Cup finals. Uh, how about read the Bible? Or serve. We'll just, we'll just uh, put these two together. Serving other people. Well, sometimes our, our answer is, well, we want to go to heaven. Jesus said... Serve the least of these. Those who serve the least of these are the sheep. Those who don't are the goats. Hello, I don't want to be a goat. I want to go to heaven. So I'm going to serve the least of these. I do these things because I want to go to heaven. I do these things because I want to get saved. I do these things because I need healing, or because somebody in my family needs healing, or because I've lost my job, or because, you know, the list could go on and on. I need something from God, I need something from Jesus, so I do these things. Like when I go home and I do things for my wife because I want to watch the Stanley Cup Finals on TV. But that there is a flaw in our approach. Here's the mature understanding. I do these things because I love Jesus. The greatest command is to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love others. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, if you don't have love, you're an annoying noise maker and nothing more. Love is the motivator behind everything that we do. I do these things because I love God, because I love Jesus. Knowing that in return, the work of Jesus is going to do the things that he's promised for me. But I don't come to Jesus to get saved. I don't come to, to church to, to go to heaven. I don't do these things for what I can get from Jesus. I do them because I love him. Just like I serve my wife at home and I want to bless her because I love her. Not because I want her to do something for me, but because I love her. It's the same concept. It's the same idea. And it's all over in Scripture. I mean, it's imprinted in Scripture that God is after the heart of a person. They worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. We can do all the religious things. that We can do all of these rituals and we can do them the right way and still completely miss out on the mission of Jesus and on the heart of Jesus. Because we've become more about the ritual than the relationship. I'm going to ask the uh, worship team to make their way on up. Can you give me a, a give a big hand to them? I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up to the front, and I'm going to close with this: When love is no longer the single greatest motivator for what you do in your marriage, or for why you do what you do in your marriage. And for why you do what you do in your faith. When love is no longer the motivating factor for why you do what you do in marriage or in faith. It is a dysfunctional relationship. If you're coming to Jesus for the ritual, if you're coming to church to go to heaven or to get whatever else it is that you want to get from God this morning. I really want you to hear this truth. Love is the single greatest motivator that should drive everything you do. 
in your marriage, and in your faith. That is healthy. That is functional. Without love as your motivator, it's a dysfunctional thing. Let's pray. God, we just want to come before your throne right now and just say, God, how grateful we are for Jesus. We are who we are because of Jesus. Not because of the things we do. Not because of where we go to church. Not because of who does more for you. None of us are more righteous or more holy than anyone else. We're all sinners, God, in desperate need of your son, Jesus. And it is your son that makes us who we are. We can't change ourselves. We can't change our wives. We can't change our husbands. We can't change our children. Our children can't change us. Only Jesus Christ changes a heart. Only you, God, can transform a life. So I pray to you, dear God, please change me. Please make me more about your son, Jesus. And I pray that for all of us this morning, God, that it's not about our religion or our rituals or what we do. It's about why. Because we love you, God. And we just can't get enough of you in our life. We can't get enough Jesus in our life. And I pray that you change us. Change me. Make me more like your son. And I pray this in Jesus Christ. Amen.
uh, every day, and that love for you will shine from our lives to the people that we meet. Just name and pray. Amen.